Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. Part three of our first Bowie knife in Texas build. Thanks for being here. So in the first part, we forged the Damascus or pattern welded steel from saw blade and 1095 high carbon steel. And then the second, we did a bunch of work on the blade, heat treating and so forth. Just pulled it out of the kiln for the tempering cycles and it is fully heat treated now and ready for all the other processes that we have to do on it. And you can see the pattern a little bit there. It's obviously gonna be a lot better once it's all done, etched and everything. So here I'm just putting a little bit of a radius right behind the plunge line a little, a little more, kind of cleaning that up. Now for finish grinding the blade here, and it's actually a little bit easier at times to grind hardened and tempered steel simply because the harder steel does not tend to, to grab or catch or wander as much on the grinding belt. You really have to be careful uh, I find, especially when the, when the steel is not giving you as much resistance, keeping everything flat and true. I think it's actually about time that I replace the, the glass on my flat platen right there. It's, uh, it's got some rather unflat characteristics to it, so it's, it's time to do that probably, but just taking my time here, and obviously the goal is to grind a consistent uh, thickness down the center line of that blade and as I mentioned in the previous installment of this project I don't have a line down the center of that to grind to because there's really no way to do that efficiently or effectively when you have a blade with a forged distal taper and a forged uh, tapered tang I suppose you could make sure the ricasso area is flat and then somehow make sure the blade is stable on that small surface but it's really not worth the trouble for me at this point so just really keeping an eye on that and, and grinding that down to a consistent thickness so I ground it down to 25 thousandths and now I am grinding it down to about 10 thousandths um, with the slack belt here putting a, a convex bevel on the rest of the blade or the, the bottom about quarter to three eighths of an inch along the edge there. And what this does is kind of gives you the best of both worlds between the flat grind and the convex. So the, the whole blade is a flat grind, full flat grind, and that gives us good cutting clearance, good uh, weight ratio. But now using this convex bevel right towards the edge there, that gives us a little extra material right behind the edge, which kind of adds for, this, for strength, adds to the strength and uh, integrity of the edge. And we will come back and put our primary bevel on that, on that uh, at the very end here. Well, not the very end, but once we're finished grinding the blade. So here I'm, I'm trying to use the disc grinder to flatten the blade out some more. And I don't really know if this was a good idea or not, uh, but I'm kind of trying to experiment with using this. I know other guys use these to good effect on applications like this. And it appears that I kind of had a little bit of a hollow grind to my blade on the flat grind area. And so I'm trying to flatten that out a little bit and make that more consistent. So, I don't know, it seemed to work okay. Uh, but just uh, making it as flat as possible here. Here I am... So I, the, the clip point on this blade was a little bit small in my opinion or the, or the swoop to it I'm not sure of the proper terminology but I'm, I'm bringing that clip point further back towards the handle and uh, let's be honest here I'm putting a little more Texas into it because it just didn't look quite like it needed to and I, I like how it turned out here so a, a more uh, gradual and uh, prominent clip point to the blade I think that adds some nice and adds a nice touch to it so you can see that um, convex bevel right up against the edge there about a quarter inch line there that we did on the grinder and in in hand sanding here we're going to blend that in with the uh, full flat grind of the blade so you can see a I think I actually made more work for myself trying to flatten the blade out and left some grind marks down the center. Probably didn't hold the blade 100% flat against that disc. Anyway, a lot of hand sanding. <laughs> Hours of hand sanding. 
probably made more for myself than I needed to, but finally got it, cleaning up the spine here, and, and here's the blade down to 600 grit finish, which is not as high as we need to go uh, before etching, but that's as far as I'm gonna go right now, because the next thing I'm gonna do is put an edge on the blade, and that is for the purpose of testing the blade before we go any further. Now, I don't uh, do this with every single blade that I make, but I do it fairly frequently. And so it's, it's uh, you could call it a quality control, you know, thing. And uh, so we're gonna put an edge on this blade. And this is, the, this is the primary bevel that I was talking about that we're putting on right at that 10 thousandths thick uh, edge. And of course, you're gonna have a burr on there, so we'll take it to the stones and work that down to a, a good edge that's not uh, rough ground, as it were. That's a 240 grit belt that I used to put the primary bevel on. So we'll work it down with, with our stones, an Arkansas stone here, hone that up a little bit, and finally use the strop to really put a nice razor sharp edge in there. I prefer to use the strop particularly when using a blade for woodworking. It, it uh, especially shines, I think, in that case. Obviously it's shaving sharp. So the goal is to chop through the two by four twice and retain a shaving sharp edge. And this is part of what the American Bladesmith Society uses for a performance test on, on knives when you test for either journeyman smith or master smith ratings. There are other components to the test in the ABS trials, but I'm just doing the two by four. There's, they, I think they, use, they do a, a, a rope cut, um, and of course, you know, they bend the blade to 90 degrees and things like that. I'm not going to do that with this blade, obviously. We're just gonna check the edge retention overall with the two by four chop. And of course, it's still shaving sharp. Now this blade is not designed as a chopper. It doesn't have the weight uh, or the balance that you should have in a chopper. It's designed as a buoy knife, which is primarily a self-defense and or a fighting blade, uh, according to the history of the, of the knife. So what that means is that I actually have to hit the two by four more times to get through it than I would otherwise, and, and it's still shaving sharp, so I'm pretty happy with that. So now that the blade is finished, uh, to a point where we can fit the guard to it. It's time to do all the sanding, or the filing, and the fitting, and the checking over and over and over again until we get that nice tight matchup. Now, I would not call myself an expert on fitting guards to knives, but one thing I have learned in my experience so far is that the better you prepare the tang, the better prep you do on the tang, uh, the easier this job is. And so stuff like a consistent gradual taper to the tang um, and, and clean. And I, I, I could have done a little better job on the tang prep on this, to be honest, but uh, we're, we're getting it done here. So just checking to see where the steel is, is contacting the brass right there. It's pretty obvious how there's a little shiny spot and that kind of thing. So another thing you can do is color the tang with, a, a, you know, either layout fluid or a magic marker, and it will deposit that onto whatever surface it's contacting on the guard. So there's a couple different ways to do it, but that's the finished product there. And you can see there are a, a few small gaps and, and uh, that actually cleans up a little better a little bit later on. So now that we have this chunk of brass fitted to the tang, or does it fit to the tang? I don't know. Anyway, we need to turn it into a guard, which means removing a lot of material from this. And right here I'm, I'm making a pattern and it is essentially a quarter of the guard and ground it out. I thought I got that on camera, but I guess not. So there it is. And it fits on the on the ricasso area on all four corners, like so. So I gotta file out that corner so it fits flush up against there. And what this will allow us to do is create a consistent, uh, repeatable um, 
contour pattern all the way around the knife and it will be what's the word it'll be matched to the knife so equal distances away from the ricasso on all four corners instead of does that make sense it has to match up to the knife to be consistent it doesn't really matter if it's consistent if it doesn't match up to the knife and here i didn't pull that tape off right there in the corner i came back and did that and rescribed but this gives us a fairly precise locator for where we need to shape the guard to and uh, just put it you know hold it tight on all four corners as you go around and you have a consistent equal matched um, guard from you know based off of where the ricasso actually sits in the guard so we're just going to grind up to our scribe lines as carefully as possible and shape that whole thing obviously there's still far too much material on the guard here so i'm going to do a little contouring and, and bring it down to something that is going to be acceptable so I, I didn't i had a vague idea of what i wanted and then i just started kind of grinding material away that's that's kind of what i did here but but what i'm what i'm kind of going for here is something that is reminiscent of the the original bowie knife era and by that i mean something that is elegant uh or or even a little bit flashy and yet very serviceable so if you get into the Bowie knife history at all, it's really interesting. Um, you know, the, the early Bowie knives looked more like a, you know, a book, butcher knife or like a long hunter blade that we're seeing in the, um, you know, the early days of, of the American colonies and so forth. Um, but as, as it developed after uh, Jim Bowie's, you know, fame in the Alamo and, and prior to that with his sandbar fight and everything, um, it became popular and most Bowie knives that were carried, bought and carried in America were actually made in England by a couple different makers in, in primarily Sheffield, England. And they would um, typically adorn their knives with engravings and, and rather fancy um, things. And so in just the way the guards were designed and stuff like that. So I feel like this guard is a, is a decent um, representation or pays some homage to, to that feel of the, of the Bowie knife. It's kind of funny because there's, there's really very few American made Bowie knives from the era of the Bowie knife. And so most of them were made in England and, and were rather fancy oftentimes. Um, but beyond that, you know, what makes a Bowie knife a Bowie knife? That's, that's a really interesting study. And um, it's really hard to point to a particular knife and say that's a Bowie knife. I mean, the range of knives that were sold and carried as quote unquote Bowie knives in that era, in Jim Bowie's era and post Jim Bowie, is, is it varies dramatically. You know, some are big knives, a lot of them are big knives, some aren't so big knives, you know, and they were called Bowie. They, there was actually, during that time, there were actually Crockett knives, uh, Davy Crockett, who also was you know, a fairly well known explorer, scout, etc. I don't know of all his exploits, but uh, really what it boils down to is the Bowie knife was a marketing scheme more than anything. And so there's all kinds of different knives that were um, sold and carried as Bowie knives. As far as the original Bowie knives, we don't know for sure which, you know, what they are, but there's some pretty good indications that we know of or have, you know, some of the original Bowie knives carried by either Jim Bowie or his brother or made by the people that he knew. Anyway. Off on a tangent there, but fit in, the, fit in the handle here. So I'm using a piece of curly koa. I believe that's what it is, pretty certain. And uh, marking that off based on where the tang is gonna go. You don't wanna drill out too far. Um, you, you wanna be able to fit that guard in. So I started out with a 3 16 drill bit and it's not very long. So I actually used my 3 8 drill bit, which is too big, but I just went down the center. Now I can use my, my uh, scraping slash carving inside carving tool and I can literally create a slot as you can kind of see on the top and bottom of that 3 8 hole and so there's going to be space around the tang on the sides but the top and bottom for you know an eighth of an inch is going to be held securely and so I can come back and bed that with epoxy or something to that effect and so in lieu of having a 3 16 inch drill bit that is long enough this this works pretty good so 
again, this is just a lot of checking and, 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 and rechecking and rechecking. And so it's, it's a tedious, laborious task. Here I'm again using the magic marker to check to see where the inside of the handle is rubbing still or, or binding up. And there you have it. It's fitting quite nicely. Uh, no light, no light showing between the guard and the in the wood. So it looks like we're good there. Obviously there's a lot of work left to do on the handle. There's way too much material and we need to make it something that's um, feels good in the hand and, and looks good. So that's where we are. That's where we're at so far guys. I really appreciate you watching and we'll be finishing this blade up on the final and fourth installment. So stay tuned for that. Appreciate you guys being here as always. We'll see you on the next video.